you unlock this door to another dimension. A dimension of schlock. A dimension of Hollywood predators. A dimension where movie 43 exists. You're moving into a dimension of both film and digital. When Incredibles 2 is still the most disappointing sequel of all time, you have just crossed into film's greatest mysteries. I'm telling you, Count, this, this guy is a total asshole. You know, he fell into hell, insulted it, and then left scot free. Like, well, what kind of name is Orange Splurt? It sounds like a finishing move in bed. I hear you, Lucifer. I hear you. I just feel that maybe you guys could solve your problems by just talking about them, you know? I mean, from the sounds of it, this so-called sex finishing move just talks and talks and talks. He talks more than I count, and I'm Count Dracula! Count, no offense, but uh, if I needed advice like that, I, I wouldn't have come to you. I need you to take care of this problem. Ah, do you mean subtract him from his life? Yes, I do. Do you mean multiply him by zero? Yes. Do you mean square him by zero and subtract him yes, by yes, one? Yes, yes, yes. Kill him, Count. Kill him. Very well. And where would I find this sex finishing move called... Orange splurge. Well, it's Halloween, and being the person uh, drawing wh whatever the f I am, I always love to get into the spirit of things and enter my annual October rabbit hole of weird, unsettling, and oftentimes frightening aspects of movie urban legends. See, creepy, unsolved mysteries have always been a cornerstone of the entertainment industry. I remember long nights as a child, not being able to sleep because of the supposed backwards messages in Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven or that cryptic title screen in Sonic CD. It was terrifying, yes, but there was also something really intriguing about it. Mysteries are, on a fundamental level, irresistible. They naturally provoke our curiosity and dig themselves into our inner psyche, begging to be explored further. The movie ones are without a doubt the weirdest and wildest of any artistic medium out there. Cinema as an art form has such a rich, deep history ripe with interesting questions throughout. Now of course, a lot of these can range from having some merit to absolute nonsense. So like everything on the internet, Take what you hear or read with a grain of salt. It's not worth freaking out about Kubrick's face being hidden amongst the clouds in The Shining. It, it, it really isn't. Stanley Kubrick, as soon as his name passes off the frame, stop and you will see that the clouds have Stanley Kubrick um, airbrushed into them, his face. With the beard and the wild hair and the whole thing. I know this one's a little harder to find and I will have to, I will have to Photoshop. One of the most infamous mysteries in all of cinema has to go to the Munchkin Suicide from the 1939 classic The Wizard of Oz. This film to me has always been a representation of innocence, optimism, and truth in the face of evil. Of course, my life, your life, everybody's life is a goddamn lie! There are Bibles worth of allegations and reports coming from the production of this film that include insane behind-the-scenes happenings. These range from Margaret Hamilton suffering third-degree burns after a special effect mishap to the entire set being covered in lethal asbestos during the famous poppy field scene, among many other unbelievable cases. The biggest mystery without a doubt to come out of this insane production, however, has to be the legendary Hanging Munchkin. Apparently, in the original VHS release of the film, a Hanging Munchkin can be seen dangling from a tree in the background as the gang leaves the apple tree yard. And if you look closely, yeah, that that uh, that, that definitely looks like a, like a hanging munchkin. With the insanity and mistreatment of everyone happening on set, many theorize that the toxic environment led to one of them committing this act. However, soon after, a remastered version of the film came out, and you can clearly see here that it's actually a bird. But visually, I mean, I mean these two don't even look remotely similar. 
Supposedly, this particular scene was filmed at a zoo and animals were just sort of all over the place, hence the random bird in the background here. This explanation left people dissatisfied with the so-called remaster and believed it to be a complete refabrication of the truth. So, is this real? Is there really a hanging munchkin in the background? No. F no. Okay, let's just think about this for two seconds. First off, movies aren't just made by one person. Film crews are made up of tons and tons of people that each have very specific roles on set. I mean, there is literally a cinematographer whose sole job it is to make sure everything in frame is correct for the picture. That includes spotting any hanging munchkins dead center in frame. But fine, fine. May maybe the cinematographer and everybody else was just too distracted by how cute Toto was. It, it can happen. Well, how about our three main characters who are in frame staring squarely towards the direction of the munchkin and don't bat an eye? What I'm saying here is that somebody would have clearly seen this at some point during the shoot or edit, and there's absolutely no way they would have released something this easily visible to the eye especially on a studio production of this scale at the time. Just to disprove this even further, let's take a deeper look at the original video itself, uploaded by now defunct channel Suicidal Munchkin. If you look really closely at the original footage, you can see that, yes, the very edges of the original bird wings are still there, which means this guy right here is alive. It seems they plopped the hanging munchkin right over where the bird was when claiming that this was the original version of the film, which, in fact, it isn't. I mean, what kind of idiot would believe that stupid far-fetched conspiracy theory, am I, am I right? <laughs> anyway, uh, Stanley Kubrick faked the first moon landing. Yeah, Kubrick's filmography has been beaten to death by theories and speculations. Full-length documentaries like Kubrick's Odyssey and Room 237 have written entirely on Kubrick's work. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen this amount of speculation around another director. And I can't speak for Kubrick's Odyssey, but, uh... Room 237 is uh, a photograph well, of Stanley Kubrick in one frame, airbrushed in. Easily the most intriguing and infamous of these theories, however, has to be the faking of the first moon landing of July 16th, 1969. Theorists say this. In a dash to beat Russia to be the first country to land on the moon successfully, the US hired Stanley Kubrick to direct and fake the first moon landing in history. Kubrick was brought in because of his helming of the incredible 2001 A Space Odyssey, and he would later drop major hints of this in his 1980 film The Shining, almost playing as a confession of sorts. This complicated situation could honestly hold an entire documentary of its own, and it has, but I'm gonna try my best to sum the biggest parts up here. For one, yeah, 2001 A Space Odyssey looks amazing, and I guess if anyone could fake a moon landing in the 60s, it would be that film's director. I mean, the movie being released in 1968 and the first moon landing being just a year or so later works pretty well in terms of a timeline, and I should probably also mention that Kubrick will later go on to use special NASA lenses on his 1975 film Barry Lyndon, which were in no way accessible to anyone at the time. Oh, <laughs> and Nixon was president at the time, so you know, uh, expect lies. Yet the biggest thing that people bring up for this theory is The Shining and the seemingly purposeful clues that are littered around. Many point to specific lines and plot points in the film that involve deceit, forced commitment, and even this scene where Danny gets up with his Apollo 11 shirt, emulating the first takeoff. At the end of the day though, there's no solid evidence at all that Kubrick was involved in any way with this situation. It just seems to ignore like 90% of the rest of the film and cherry picks any and all coincidences that could even remotely support the conspiracy. 2002's mockumentary Dark Side of the Moon seems to be a major player in what really grew the theory into having as much support as it has now, containing interviews with what looks to be Stanley's family giving authority and credit to the moon landing mystery. However, as stated before, this is a mockumentary, so everything here is completely fake. These so-called interviews with the Kubricks were taken completely out of context from other sources and were shaped to fit the false narrative of the film. However, what's interesting about Dark Side of the Moon is that it's kind of hard to tell it's a mockumentary. I personally gave it a watch when researching for this video, and I have to say, for something that is so well known for being a fake, without that prior knowledge, it's pretty hard to tell for the first 40 minutes or so. I think if Grandma turns this on and shuts it off halfway through, she'd probably come away thinking that Kubrick faked the moon landing and joined the local Facebook conspiracy group. Now, while I don't want to go into a whole thing about social responsibility, especially when dealing with something like this, I do think that Dark 
dark side could have been handled with a little more care, seeing as how this is commonly referred back to when looking at how this conspiracy became as big as it did. And this is the problem I have with a lot of overblown conspiracy theories like this. It just feels like people taking one small truth and stretching it and manipulating it to fit their narrative. Aside from the Kubrick conspiracy, just thinking about the mechanics and technology behind what it would take to fake the moon landing as it was presented is just impossible, and I can confidently say that this conspiracy is fake. To me, it's as far-fetched as saying Kubrick almost made a Lord of the Rings adaptation starring the Beatles, you know? Wait, that was actually a thing? Both The Wizard of Oz and Kubrick have garnered some of the most popular movie mysteries of all time, but my personal first experience with one of these was with Back to the Future 3. Yes, I'm talking about this kid here, hiding in the back of one of the shots near the end of the film. No, this isn't on purpose. In terms of the scene's context, he acts as a background character and nothing more. The best explanation I could find for this was that the kid needed a piss break and decided the best time to let everybody know was during an actual take, which... Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's probably not the best time, especially when that's the take that ends up in the final film. 1985's Teen Wolf follows this pattern of Michael J. Fox and terrible extras quite nicely in the film's final scene. You got the usual 80s end celebration scene. Yes, cheesy slow-mo credits in included, of course. And right there on the top, you can see a dude, pants fully unzipped, wiener completely out. For decades, people believed that this restless zipper belonged to a male, but with a slight adjustment to the cropping and quality of the film and its newer additions, you can clearly see that no, it, it, it does in fact belong to a female. And even to this day, nobody has been able to track down the person and figure out exactly what happened and why, and it's unfortunately not looking like it's going to happen anytime soon. Okay, so it's it's Halloween, and, and, and so far I gotta be honest, I, I haven't really been spooked yet. I mean, the whole munchkin thing was cool and all, but uh, I'm gonna need something a bit more, you know? N not more dead munchkins, I, I mean... Well, actually, that might do the trick. Oh, why, hello there, Orange. On your left. Oh, hello, Orange Count. It is I, Count Dracula. Ah, ah, ah. What, like, like Sesame Street? No, 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 no. I'm totally original. Whatever you say, man. Next thing I know, you'll be bringing in Jigsaw or something like that. Oh, oh, wait, let me guess. It's, it's not Jigsaw. It's something original, right? I am totally going to scare the sh out of him. Just waiting on the count signal. It's gonna be so awesome! I don't know what you're talking about. Anyway, I was sent by an old friend. Do you remember Satan by any chance? What, you mean the Sony Pictures guy? I, I thought we were cool. No, you are not cool. You are the opposite. Hot. Very hot. Wait, no, not, not hot. Satan would be hot because of the whole fire thing. Yes. Satan is hot. Wait. No, hold on. I I need to think about this. Give me like give me like twenty minutes. What? Shh I'm thinking about it. <sighs> okay, um Anyways, uh, I feel like movie urban legends tell us a lot about ourselves. We desperately want a clear explanation to everything, even when it comes to our own lives. Questions are the entire foundation for any religion, and sorry to break it to you, but we're all gonna die. And there's nothing we can do about it. It's an interesting struggle between the uncertain and the inevitable, a longing for an answer when there may just not be one. Gee, that, that was heavy. Tune in next week, kids, when we take a look at what will happen when our sun explodes. Thankfully, with these types of mysteries, there's usually some sort of explanation we can get from them. Eventually. Leonard Nimoy, yes, that Leonard Nimoy's 1987 film Three Men and a Baby is a prime example of this common development with its infamous ghost boy urban legend. This is possibly the creepiest of all movie mysteries because of how jarring and visceral it is at first glance. See, Three Men and a Baby is nothing but an innocent family comedy flick about three bachelors who are forced to take care of a baby and change their lives in the process. You know, the usual been there, done that routine of these types of movies. But the really interesting part comes with the terrifying discovery of a certain unwanted character, or as the internet dubs him, Ghost Boy. In the background of this very scene, he's standing there, Norman Bates looking all. Legend says that this boy died in his apartment with this ghost coming back to haunt the cast and crew of the film. While certainly creepy with that context in mind, it's that time of the video again. It's fake. To start off, this isn't even an apartment, it, it, it's a soundstage, and that Ghost Boy? He's just a cardboard cutout of Ted Danson. It's pretty understandable how this could pass off as a creepy uncovering of a haunting spirit with the quality of VHS tapes back then, but now in a time of high-definition picture, 
it's pretty easy to sniff out situations like these in an instant. And that's kind of been the case for a lot of these things. Modernity has visually debunked so many of these urban legends and mysteries that eventually, it's going to be pretty difficult to have another one of these things happen again. And that brings me to cursed movies. And no, I, I, do, I don't mean cursed in the same way that Chris Pratt playing Mario is, uh, but actually cursed. There are plenty of examples of this that have circulated around the industry for a while now, most notably the Superman curse, stating that anyone who plays the caped man of steel will suffer from life-ruining misfortune, or the Poltergeist curse, a series of ridiculously misfortunate fatal tragedies that involved much of the main cast of the film after its release. Now, out of respect for those who have passed, and to not boil their deaths down to some stupid internet myth, I'll leave it at that. But I just feel that movie curses as a whole, I personally just don't have as much fun with. Partially because A, they actually dealt with real life events and paint them in a certain picture, often distastefully, and B, they just feel like dumb coincidences. Accidents and tragedies happen all the time, and these are often plagued by inconsistencies within their own rule sets. Yes, many unfortunate events have happened to many Supermen, but what about the ones that haven't? What about the many actors and poltergeists who are still alive and well to this day? I, I can see right now that I'm just proving my point on existentialism right here by asking all these questions, but... But I, I'm self-aware, okay? I don't know. I, I guess it's just a matter of what you personally get out of one of these movie mysteries. I mean, I, I know I have my favorites. And truth be told, like Chris Pratt being cast as Mario, some things don't need to be explained. Sometimes, just letting yourself fall into one of these things can be a lot of fun, whether it's true or not. Are, are you still thinking? What? No. I, I fell asleep because you were so boring. I still have to kill you, though. Can't this can't this wait until tomorrow? It's it's not midnight yet. Wow, time moves very slow when you're bored. Thank you so much. No matter. I challenge you to a count off. Oh God, I'm left-brained, man. But please, let's not. Ah ah ah! You will have to. You will pay for being such a weird finishing move during sex. Wait, what? Time to begin with my special attack. Fun. Oh, sh Uh... Two? Three. Four? Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. <laughs> One thousand and thirty-five. One thousand and thirty-six. One thousand and thirty-seven. Seventy thousand five hundred and six times five. Seventy thousand five hundred and six times six. Fifty billion times forty-seven plus two. Infinity. Sh That's right, Splurty. I'm sorry to say, but it looks like your number is up. Ah, ah, ah. Wait. Eh? Infinity. Times infinity. What? No! How could it be? I, nobody has ever said anything that blatantly stupid. I can't. No! No! Gee, Dracula, your, your life went just like that. I hope you counted your blessings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm gonna go.